Last week we started looking at Jeremiah chapter 2, and we got about halfway through with the chapter. And the main idea is that Israel has abandoned God, and so we're going to continue with that prophecy. Um, as I mentioned last week, it is one that happens near the beginning of uh, Jeremiah's ministry period of 40 years. So it's about 625, 627. And this is about the time that King Josiah is doing all of his religious reforms and, and trying to, you know, rebuild the temple and the law is found and all that stuff is happening. So we ended off on verse 25 last week. So verse 26, as a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the people of Israel are disgraced, they, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets. So um, the this right here, as a thief is disgraced, don't think of like a thief continually being caught. The idea is when he is initially caught, because after he's caught, you know, people already think of him as a as a thief. But it's talking about that, like, okay, let's say you're you're stealing money from your mom's purse, right? And then you're caught that that first time. That that's kind of the idea that the that the Hebrew is trying to get across. As a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the people of Israel are disgraced. Um, Something that's kind of interesting to, to know, and I mentioned this uh, probably a week or two ago, but I want to mention it again here, here as it applies, is that the leadership of Israel was, um, was you know, being held to account by God. Was, earlier in the same prophecy, he's talking about that. And um, uh, But one thing that's very important to note about that is that the leadership was also partly responsible for what was happening. Now, there's a few ways that that applies. First off, God typically holds leadership, especially in the church, but also everywhere, um, more accountable than than regular people. Um, he holds them to a higher standard. He puts them in for greater responsibility, that kind of stuff. So, you know, there, there is something there. And the leadership was definitely partly responsible for a large part of the state of affairs for the nation. Um, now, I do, I do want to say, though, that everyone is definitely responsible for their own actions, yes, but these people and people's actions were affected by the leaders, and the leaders... Um, you know, they're, they're placed by God to hold the line and, and to teach what the right thing is to do, but instead they were leading the people in doing wrong. And then even when they, they did something right, they weren't wholeheartedly setting the people back on the course. And it was kind of like a, a snowball effect. Once it got rolling, it was just, it was, it was too little too late. Um, so it, we see by and large that doing the wrong thing was the popular choice. Do, deciding to do what was right, that was, that was the scarcity. Like, um, even nowadays, when there's something that happens in the culture, I mean, maybe maybe not all the time, but for a large bit of it, you know, when, when something really bad happens in our culture, at least there'll be a group of people that rise up and say, hey, this thing was bad. I mean, um, think, think about the different uh, racial riots that were going on uh, in 2019, especially with like the whole George Floyd and all that stuff that was going on. And that, um, so, so now, you know, imagine how there are people who, nowadays who stand up for things um, that they believe, you know, to be right. Well, here, that really wasn't happening. So Jeremiah is saying, hey, y'all need Jesus. <laughs> and uh, you leaders aren't being leaders. And so then, you know, that's kind of like everybody's doing wrong. And obviously that's going to that's gonna cause Jeremiah to be very much so not appreciated <laughs> as a person. People don't really like being told that what they're doing is wrong, especially if not they're a leader, you know, still being told what they're doing is wrong they say to wood you are my father and to stone you gave me birth uh, that being the elements that idols are made were made out of um, they have turned their backs to me and not their faces and, and that um, doesn't really carry over exactly how it reads in hebrew the idea is that when you turn to me you're turning your neck to me in, in other words they're being they're being uh, stiff-necked uh, hard-hearted um, yet when they are in trouble they say come and save us where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they if they can save you when you are in trouble. For you, Judah, have as many gods as you have towns. So something that's very interesting uh, in what's happening here is they were, the people were very much so religious and sincere. The issue wasn't that they, you know, uh, weren't worshiping Yahweh at all. It was that they were trying to worship Yahweh while worshiping these other things. They were trying to, you know, make engraved images and all these different things, which God said, hey, no, let's not do that. Uh, way back in the law, and this is hundreds of years later, they just kind of like, we're not going to read the Bible. It doesn't really have, apply to our lives today. And obviously, it did apply to their lives. Um, so they, 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 the, the interesting thing here, though, is that in the ancient world, and I've mentioned this a couple times already, the people didn't really believe that the idol was the god. They believed that it was kind of like a, a cosmic gateway um, to an aspect of the deity. It's It's kind of hard to say it because it's hard to understand but so th that's kind of the idea they have like this whole you know real in-depth thing going on 
Um, and, and yet, whenever God's talking to them about their, their idols, he talks to them as though the wood is the thing that they're worshiping. And uh, that, that, that's, that's always kind of funny <laughs> because it's like God's, you know, mocking their practice. And, um, but with that being said, by this point, it w probably wasn't overly well defined in their minds. Um, the separation between the idol isn't really the thing. If you do something for long enough, you kind of just start forgetting about the where the line is. So I can easily imagine that after all these years, they, they might have started thinking, thinking of the idol as the god, literally. Um, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, and obviously God wasn't fooled by what they were fooled by. And so then the next kind of ironic thing here is that it says, they say to the wood, you are my father, and to stone you gave me birth. So imagine the, the, the irony here. They're, getting, they're crediting the idols with creating them. And then they have the nerve to turn around and ask God for help. I mean, that's like, Oh, cup, oh, mighty cup, you have created me with your amazing tea. Oh, God, can you help me out of this jam? And it's like, well, you know, you know, just uh, imagine this. They have turned their backs on me and not their faces, yet when they are in trouble, then they say, come and save us. <clears throat> yet, uh, okay, so, so uh, one way that we kind of do this nowadays is we pray only when we're in trouble. Um, you know, we live our best life, and then as soon as we're in trouble, oh, well, now, God, why have you abandoned me? Where are you during this thing of me, you know, uh, with poor health? And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about um, something that happened with, well, actually, you know what happened with me last year. You know, where I was just kind of bitter and upset about, you know, the way my life had gone and, and ministry and all kinds of different stuff. You know, and, and wasn't really praying or reading the Bible. And then something bad happens, and all of a sudden, God, why have you forsaken me? You know, and uh, I can see now how that kind of sounds like I was attacking you. I, I, I was not. I was not. Um, so, anyways, uh, so praying only when we're when we're uh, in trouble. But we all kind of put our trust in, in, in our faith in something in life. I mean, every single one of us does. Um, back then, it was idols. Uh, nowadays, we, we don't have idols so much in the Western world. Sometimes we still do, but by and large, we don't. Um, I've noticed that we put our faith in other things, sometimes doctors, sometimes our health or our diet or our youth or our strength or, or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's our, it's our, it's our, it's our intellect. We, we think, okay, this is something I can believe in. And then as we get older, those things kind of become a little bit shaky and it's hard for us to, to cope because that's what we've built our whole life on. Um, I, I know a lot of people who, um, I'm thinking of someone very specific, who they, uh, they were always, you know, uh, in really good health, they loved, they loved the gym like way more than you guys, way more than you guys. And I mean, th that was like their life is like this health thing. And then they got this this certain disease, and they had to had to pretty much change their whole thing. And they didn't even know what to do. They they almost you know they were just like hopeless by the end of it because the thing that their whole life revolved around that was their god, that was what they were worshiping, that was their idol. And then they had nowhere to go with that because it was. The, the thing that happened to them, it was something that they, they couldn't just power through and go to the gym anyways. I mean, <laughs> incapable. So, um, but the, the, the thing is that none of those things can save us and none of those things can stop death, like, like a doctor. They can't, a doctor can't rest, bring rest to my soul. And if it's my time, there's not a thing that a doctor can do. I've seen way too many of my friends over the past couple of years die um, when they were in the hospital they you know everything the doctor could do they did and and it was just there was just there was nothing you could do about it and um but yet still putting our faith and trust in that and that's kind of the same thing that's happening here the the the, the Judaites Israelites are um they're putting their faith in these idols even though there's literally nothing that they can do to either save them give them peace or um uh, prevent death from happening so obviously there's this big irony between you know they don't see God who made them but then they make idols and think the idol for making them. It's just so backwards there. Um, and uh, But that also brings up the idea um, here, and it's echoed, especially, or not echoed because Isaiah was written first, but um, it's throughout the other prophets too, the idea that if, if, it, if it's created, it's not much of a god. Now, if you know anything about pagan gods, this is a slap in the face to pretty much most other gods because you have you have like sometimes like you'll have like a sky god right and he like impregnates the earth god or whatever and they have these other gods and those are the gods that they worship to those other gods which would meant that they were created and uh, so y Yahweh is not simply ridiculing the idol itself he's talking about the history of those gods with the way that they were created and how laughable it is um, 
Now, obviously, we can tell throughout history of the way that 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 gods have been created in the minds of people, and then you know, kind of solidified. Um, and we've I've talked about that to great lengths, so I really don't want to repeat it again. Okay, and then on the last part of this section, why do you bring charges against me? Now, remember back in verse nine, he said that he was bringing charges against them. So now we have like this whole backwards thing. You guys are bringing charges against me. You have all rebelled against me, declares the Lord. In vain I punished your people. They did not respond in correction, to correction. Your sword, excuse me, has de has devoured your prophets like a ravenous lion. So people who rebel against God often have a deep-rooted anger, a bitterness, or rebellion, just something that's that's there where if you try and talk to them about God, especially people who used to be Christians and then kind of backslide, and you try to talk to them about God, you know, later, it's, it's very much so um, antagonistic. They have this idea of, of, God, you don't love me. You know, you're just attacking me. You're being mean to me and uh, or you know you aren't there for us god you don't care and uh, because you just your heart gets to this point of just kind of being you know just dead to it but but the thing here that he's saying is why do you bring charges against me why do you why are you saying oh you are attacking me god why are you you're picking on me when the truth is that you guys have all rebelled against me it's it's, it's you guys who are doing the thing um so a good modern example of this is um I'm not going to follow God's word. I'm not going to live according to the life that God, you know, has told us to live by as a Christian. And then when bad things happen, I'm going to get upset at God for letting it, for letting something bad happen. You know, like the Bible will say, for instance, hey, don't be unequally yoked. So what that means is Christians shouldn't be getting with non-Christians. And then we say, yeah, that's a good idea, but I'm going to do it anyways because yeah, whatever. And so we do, and then things don't work out how we want. <laughs> And then it's like, oh well, God, you've brought me this heartache, and it's like, well, no, God didn't, God didn't do that. Like you made your own choices, but yet somehow God's always to blame, and that's exactly what's happening with the Israelites. They're doing, they're they're doing them, they're doing living their life however they want to live it, and then they're saying, oh, but God, it's your fault, and you, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. It's completely unrealistic. So then here it says. In vain I punished your people. And so kind of sometimes we get this idea of what Jesus should be like in our minds and, and what he actually is like in reality. And it's kind of hard to rectify the two. So God punishes us so that we will grow and change and turn from sin. That's, 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 that's why if he doesn't do that, we get into the most comfortable space for us. Okay, so without pain, there is no growth. That's just, that's just the way of life. Anytime that you want to grow, Pain is by, necess by necessity involved. So here's here's how you're living your life. You want to change it, but change hurts. And so you have to go through a period of, of pain. But it's not just that. It's also that pain is how God promotes us. If God, if you're here and God wants to take you here, like let's say, for instance, um, you are a worship leader and he wants to be you wants you to be a pastor you're a, you're you're just a church goer and he wants you to be a missionary um, you are um, working for somebody and he wants you to start your own business you, there's going to be a process somewhere in that go, from going from this level to this level there's going to be a process of being completely and utterly broken where you um, uh, go through more pain than you thought possible and then you keep going through more and more and more until you feel like literally there's nowhere to go um, and then once you get to that point God's able to kind of cause you to not just rethink your life and your, and your thoughts, but but able to take that brokenness and kind of reform you to reach a, a higher height than you would have reached before. Um, it's a, like the saying, no pain, no gain. It's exact kind of concept there. Pain is how God promotes us. If you're going through a time of, of pain that goes for years and years and years, look for somewhere after that, how can I use this to impact somebody else's life? I mean, think about all the different people who, you know, went through foster care and weren't adopted, didn't feel like they were loved, and then they turn around and they use that as an opportunity to reach other people that weren't that would have been, you know, unreached and, and reach that, you know, that that higher uh, threshold than they, than they would have been had they not gone through that tr terrifying, troubling situation that they did. So when we think of punishments nowadays, though, when, typically we think of something like a spanking, like God's giving us spankings, you know, and. God's punishment is more like discipline, and that comes in kind of di stages. He he tries to, to teach us, like through his word, for instance. He gives us opportunity. Um, he tests our hearts, all kinds of different things. And then sometimes when we continually harden our hearts like Israel had done, he brings us a time of punishment where, where we go through a period in our lives when, when things aren't going the way we want, either financial pr trouble or, or not that all financial trouble is, is from God. 
<clears throat> and um, and so so God's punishment is more like a process of growing us, and and it's not always dependent on sin. Like whether you sinned or not, God is still going to discipline you. He's still going to grow you. You know what I mean? And but if you have sinned, it's just going to be harder. <laughs> it's going to be harder. So your sword has devoured your prophets like a ravenous lion. Th th this didn't really make sense when I read it, um, and I really actually had to get some outside help to understand what the heck he was talking about here. The basic idea is that God had brought them prophets, but they killed those prophets so they wouldn't have to listen and change. Um, so it's not really your sword has devoured your prophets, more like your sword has devoured my prophets like ravenous lion. And that goes right along with what he said there. They did not respond to correction. The prophets were bringing the correction. They weren't listening and said they were killing them. So, uh, let's see here. And this is the end of chapter 2. And then the prophecy resolves in chapter... Oh, wait, no, this isn't the end of chapter 2. This one and the next one are tied together. You of this generation, consider the, the word of the Lord. Have I been a, a desert to Israel or a land of great darkness? Why do my people say we are free to roam? We will come to you no more. Does a young woman forget her jewelry, a bride, her wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How skilled you are at pursuing love. Even the worst of women can learn from your ways. On your clothes is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor. Though you did not catch them breaking in, yet in spite of all this, you say, I'm innocent. So there's a lot going on here, and I'm just trying to break it down so we don't stay on this for too long. Um, the idea, he says here, why do my people say we are free to roam? See, God... Um, they had this idea that God had been bad to them and he hadn't satisfied them in the way that they wanted. So they were looking somewhere else, like greener pastures is how we want. Like, okay, so we're living somewhere and we don't like it, so we look for somewhere that we could live better. We have a greener pasture mentality. It's exactly what's happening here with, with Israel, is they're looking at God and saying, and he, but he, he's kind of responding and saying, look, I was I ever a desert to you? Was I ever a land of darkness to you? Wasn't I good to you? Yet you guys are saying, hey, we're free to roam. We're, we can go look and a great in a greener greener hill somewhere, and then here it says, "Does a young man forget her jewelry?" And the idea here is that you know, in the same way that that a woman like wouldn't leave her house with like her jewelry on and stuff, um, in that same way, God is much more important than those things. Yet Israel isn't even concerned about their God. They're 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 not just walking out of the house without the jewelry. They're going throughout their life without God in it. And um, you know, I, being in ministry all these years, I can say this very very. Um, safely, most Christians live in the same manner today in the Western world. I don't know about the, the third world countries, but everywhere that I've been to in California and, and New Mexico and Texas and all, and all those different churches that I went to and the church work that I did in those different states, um, I, this is something that just is a recurring theme where, where Christians want to call themselves Christians, but they don't really, God's not really a part of their life. And so then what they try to do is they say, okay, look, Here's my life, and then I'll go to church. And the thing is, God doesn't want like a, a section of your life. He wants to be the foundation of your life. You know what I mean? Where it's not like you're remembering to include Him. It's that your life is is in, is is wrapped up in God. And um, so this isn't something that that just Israel was doing. This is something that we have a tendency to do. So here it says, "On your clothes is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor." Now the law allowed for you to murder a thief if they robbed you during the night but not during the day i don't necessarily think that's what this is talking about so much as just somebody who is hasn't done you any harm and you're still trying to destroy them trying to trying to hurt them um, treating them unjustly and also yes murdering them i mean we already talked about last week the way that they had a valley where they were taking their children and, and slaughtering their children to bring fertility on the land um, now, remember, that might seem crazy to you, but remember that um, a lot of children died stillbirth. A lot of children died um, before they even reached adulthood, uh, and a lot of women weren't able to produce children at all. They didn't have modern medicine, or if they did produce child, they might die during the process of childbirth. So remember that trying to murder murder your child might seem crazy right now. But they were doing it in hopes that the gods would allow them less um, death in the long run. So from that perspective, I mean, think of us. We, we, kill, we kill babies and abortions all the time, and we don't even do it for a reason other than we just don't want the baby. See what I mean? So um, without God's law as the standard of right and wrong for them, morality became nothing more than an opinion. And it's the same thing, it's, it's the same thing now. If you're either going to live by God's rule of morality or you're just going to make it up as you go. I don't need God's law. I, 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 can, I know what to do, what, what the right thing is to do. Oh, 
Okay, so you agree with every other every other person's sense of morality? Well, no, of course not. We all have our own idea of morality. So if we're not living by God's standard, it's at the end of the day, it's it's my standard. You know, we can't have it as you know I can live my life however I want and then still say I'm a moral person because if God says, hey, here's a standard, and I say, no, I'm not listening to your standard. I'm listening to my own standard. I mean. It, it's either my shifting thinking because my thoughts are going to change over time or it's God's eternal word which is based on you know his character which is obviously unchanging so um, but with that let me just kind of addendum that doesn't mean that the law was meant to be followed as a moral compass for Christians okay the law was given to the Jews not for us to follow today um, it can kind of show us glimpses of morality, but not just blindly reading it and then applying it. If we just blindly read it and apply it, that means you can't shave the corners of your of your beard. Can't can't do that. That that's a big no no. It it, it means um, let's see what's another thing. Um, a tattoo can send you to hell. <laughs> you know those kinds of things. So you know obviously the the law people Christians get this thing where they want to read the Bible, which is good, but then they they don't understand the differences between then and then and now, and so they say okay. So I'm just going to read the law and going to live that, but you you aren't meant to live according to the law. The law is meant to point us to Christ, which. Well, if you guys ever want to do a study on the law, we'll do that some other time where I can kind of walk you through how to apply the law to your life. But I really don't want to get into that right now. The moral of the story being here that they weren't living according to God's law, and so then it was resulting in them in 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 in, in injustice, and it was also resulting in uh, mistreatment and in you know the, their attitude towards others, and also they were murdering people too. It was just, was not good. Like he just said, the prophets were getting murdered, and now here we're talking about innocent people getting murdered. Um, <clears throat> so since God's law wasn't there, morality became nothing more than an opinion. Injustice, especially to the poor, was a cause of judgment. If you read through the law, God talks, you know, okay, be ju you know, work through, you need to be just and all these things. And he says, now, if you guys mistreat the poor, though, that takes us to a whole other level of, of what I, the punishment that I'm going to bring. So this is exactly what happened. They were, they were mistreating the poor, and God was like, well, I'm not just going to let that one go. Um and remember, we're looking at the end of, of the picture here. God had been patient. We're talking about it for hundreds of years. But that doesn't mean that there was no justice. What we do is if God doesn't respond right now, we assume that he doesn't care or that there's no justice. But God had waited for hundreds of years before he said, okay, enough is enough. We're done. And um, that doesn't mean that there's no justice. And uh, God definitely doesn't call guilty people sinless. Okay, And here is the end of Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. He is not angry with me, but I will pass judgment on you because you say I have not sinned. Why do you go about so much? Why do you go about so much changing your ways? You will be disappointed by Egypt as you were by Assyria. You will also leave that place with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those uh, you trust. You will not be helped by them. And so I'll explain kind of some of these things. Some of this is lost in translation with with the time, and I'll just kind of break it down here. So. Um, the last verse ended, I am innocent, and then it goes on, he is not angry with me. And so you see that they, they not only were they not repenting, they weren't admitting their fault, they weren't turning from their fault, they were also denying that anything had ha even happened. Uh, most who have been living in sin have this attitude. You'll find that if, if you start doing something that you know you're not supposed to do, you'll start having this attitude too. You give it time and, and it'll develop. Oh, I haven't done anything wrong. And that's because sin comes in three stages. The first stage is, is the fight against conscience. This is where our, our conscience bothers us. We know that what we're doing is wrong, but for whatever reason, we just keep on doing it. I, I don't know why we always have different reasons for why we do that. The second stage is where we seek to justify, sometimes to ourselves and sometimes to other people. So because the conscience is bothering us, other people are, are looking at us and, and we see that judgment, we feel the shame, we have to obviously either stop doing the thing or justify the thing. So we either withdraw from people so they can't tell us, you know, that what we're doing is wrong, or we start arguing with people, um, or we just get friends around us who are doing that same thing so we feel better about it. Um, and so we, we kind of seek to justify it, and then we get to the last stage, which is a very difficult stage to get out of. Not impossible, but very difficult. And that's where we live boldly in the sin. We've been doing this sin for so long that we just know this is who I am now. And occasionally something will still come by to kind of remind us that what we're doing is wrong and you just won't listen to it. Um, don't mistake this for being at peace with it. This oftentimes produces very poor sleep and that kind of stuff. So it's not the same as being okay with it. It's just you are um, not fighting it. It's an active part of your life. 
Um, there's actually an entire branch of modern Christianity which is focused on, on um, God being just a loving God without rules and living a Christian life without any accountability. And uh, God judges this kind of life as, as even harder, harsher than um, somebody who just like messes up. And that's one of the things that's happening here. That he's, they're, they're sinning, and they're not listening to God, and then they're killing prophets, and then this other prophet's coming by and saying, look, this isn't going to work. You're saying, hey, I'm innocent. God's not really angry with me. I don't know how you are missing this. Yes, yes, I am angry with you. I, you, you have, you, have um, uh, you are doing something wrong. And then he says here, but I will pass judgment on you because you say I have not sinned. Why do you go about so much changing your ways? And the idea here is that um, without God guiding our lives, we kind of roam about unsure. If you don't have have God as a purpose in your life, you, your purpose in life kind of, you just have to focus on something and just kind of mute the the nagging notion that there's more for your life. And you keep going and going, but your life kind of just kind of flops around. It has no clear direction and purpose. And that's mostly because we were meant to live for more than just a passing thing. In our heart of hearts, we know that all those things aren't going to be there for eternity. You know what I mean? Like we enjoy things, we, we we like it, but there's always like for instance, have you ever tried day after day after day watching nothing but Netflix all day long, and you get really really bored, right? And you 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 feel real antsy, like you know you need to get up and go do something. And even if you train yourself to ignore that voice, that voice will keep coming back. And that's because in our heart of hearts, that's what I'm talking about. We we kind of we know that there's more to life than, than just these pleasures. We know that there's something that's lasting. And uh, as long as we look to the world for that answer, we're not going to find it. We'll always be disappointed. And uh, here it says, you will be disappointed by Egypt. So remember earlier he talked about the two alliances with Egypt and Assyria. So their, Assyri their alliance with Assyria had already failed. That's why he says, you will uh, be disappointed by Egypt as you were by Assyria. And uh, they will also soon find that Egypt will not be there for them either. And but generally, though, uh, when you put your hope in people, you're going to be disappointed. Like, I always see these things on, on, on like the internet that say, hope in humanity restored. There, there, there's there's no point in having hope in humanity. They, there will always be people who disappoint you, no matter who it is. I mean, if, think of if those... Um, well, I guess I'm the only married person in, in, in this room. We are. Uh, when you're married, you know, your spouse disappoints you. You know, your your, your family growing up, they, they disappoint you. I mean, there's times when everybody in your life is going to disappoint you. And setting up on somebody on that stand, up on that pedestal that they have to be perfect all the time, that's just super unrealistic. It's not going to happen. I mean, your mom disappoints you. Your dad disappoints you. People disappoint you. <clears throat> and... Uh, Okay. Uh, and then here it says, play, um, you will also leave that place with your hands on your head. This is something that doesn't really apply nowadays, but back in the day in the ancient Near Eastern world, um, this was a sign of mourning, basically. I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying it here, but you can kind of see them in, in different, you know, uh, reliefs on, on, in, in, in ancient, you know, drawings and stuff where, where they have their heads on, on their hands on their heads. And it's just, the idea here is that it is a sign of mourning. That's it. It's just. So that basically they're going to be disappointed with what's going on. And then here it says, uh, the, the Lord has rejected those you trust. You will not be helped by them. So uh, typically you don't want to be making alliances with people who aren't on good terms with God. But uh, also this was a kind of a, a sign of where Israel was out. They were aligning themselves with people that God disapproved of. And I think that that kind of shows their heart on the issue. Um, and this is kind of a good test to see where you're at. What kind of people are you attracting? What kind of people are you hanging around? What kind of people um, are you looking for approval from? from? And uh, that, that's just a good kind of area of, of way of kind of checking your heart. Um, they say that you will be like the people you hang around. So if you want to be like a certain way, surround yourself with those kinds of people. You know, they say if you want to be more successful in business, Surround yourself with people who are more successful than you, and then eventually you will attain that level. If you want to be around people who are more godly, stop hanging around people who are sleeping around and doing drugs and hang around with people who are godly. And, uh, okay, so they were aligning themselves with people God disapproved of. They were trying to live their life on their own terms. Before I get into the very last part of this uh Prophecy it ends in verse five of chapter three. Any questions so far with what I talked about? I'm kind of not trying to bog down here, but I don't want to be rushing too fast. Good. Okay. 
If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? Now, this is something that is kind of difficult if you don't understand the law. So, in Deuteronomy, if a woman... Okay, so let's say two people are married, and she divorces her husband. Or, I'm sorry, women weren't allowed to divorce at the time. Her husband divorces her, and then she gets remarried. And for whatever reason, that marriage ends. Either uh, they divorce or, 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 or the guy dies. The, the first husband couldn't take her back in the law. And the idea behind it, um, there's, there's, there's a few ideas. But first off, well, before I say this, I want to say this. This was not a thing that Christians are not allowed to do. This is a thing that the, that the Jews were not allowed to do. So keep that in mind. The law was not for all time. It wasn't an absolute standard of morality. It was just to point us to Christ, and we have to look in it to find the principles of morality, not to try and live by the law. We are not Jews. So that's the first thing. Okay. Second off, uh, this was uh, mostly because she was disgraced by the man. So she, he, this was kind of like a, a life-changing thing for her. Um, and... Uh, you know, the, the idea here is that he she, he put her away, he divorced her because there was something wrong with her, some impurity, some great impurity. So if, if another husband came by and took her again, the idea would be that, that he was okay with with her, you know, whatever impurity w was, was there, he was okay with that. And um, so then for the husband to take him back, not only was kind of like a whole slap again with that whole thing and kind of dragging her through the mud, uh, but also it was a way that the man could have profited financially. See what I mean? So here they are together, and he divorces her, puts it away. So then she gets married. Oh, <laughs> now she's got a household now. Get with her again, you stand to profit. See what I mean? And then another issue is it kind of brings up a whole issue with the children. Whose inheritance do they get? Does the inheritance go to this person or this person? It's a whole long thing there. So in order to just protect the issue, God just made this rule of, hey, one and done. If you guys are going to divorce, don't take her back. Just let it go. Well, let, if they got, if she married somebody else afterwards. And then the last thing it says here. Oh, oh. So how does that apply? So okay. Um, in the same way he says this about about how you guys know about about this thing with the law, and the, how that would that would de defile the land. But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. You're going with all these other gods. You're worshiping all these other gods. But now you're trying to return to me. And uh, look up to the barren heights and see, is there any place where you have not been ravished? Uh, which is obviously a sexual term. By the rod roadside you sat waiting for lovers, sat like a nomad in the desert. You have defiled the land with your prostitution and wickedness. Obviously, he's not just talking about sexual morality here. Um, he's talking about the worship of the other gods. But as I mentioned before, the worship of those other gods oftentimes involved cult prostitutes. So it includes sexual morality as well. Um, therefore, the showers have been withheld, and no spring rains have fallen. So we see here, definitely, God does bring punishment through natural means, too. Um, sometimes we think that God, you know, doesn't bring punishment, and sometimes we think that God only brings punishment. None of those views are correct, but God sometimes does bring things like, you know, natural disasters and, and, and those kinds of things um, on, on immorality. Yes, absolutely. But before anybody fools you... America is not um, exempt from that because there are Christians living here. America was never a Christian nation who had a um, promise from God. They were never like a second Israel, as a lot of times people have taught. Um, had, the error has been taught basically that um, we, the nation of America, can claim the promises that were sent to Israel, which is just not true. If we turn from our sin, that doesn't mean that the land will suddenly prosper. It means that if we as Christians will turn back to God, God will God will renew our spirits and make us prosper. There's a total difference there. Um, and that's also not to say that nothing bad will happen. Yet you have the brazen look of a prostitute. You refuse to blush with shame. Um, if you guys have ever talked to prostitutes, um, they're not very shy about the whole sexual thing. <laughs> um, you know, you know, when we talk about sexual, like, <laughs> well, they really don't do that. They kind of deal with it all the time. So you refuse to blush. Uh, have you not? Uh, have you not just called to me, my father, my friend from my youth? Will you always be angry? Will your wrath continue forever? And uh, th it's kind of funny here because this is in the middle of King Josiah's reforms. I mentioned that. Okay, remember that. And they're repenting, but they're only doing it in words. They're not doing it in their heart. They said the right prayers, 
but they didn't really want to change. See, this is why it says, this is how you're talking. You're saying the right things. The prayer isn't bad. But you do all the evil that you can. You just won't stop doing the thing. And then you say, oh, my father, my friend, will you always be angry with me? And it's like, just stop doing the thing that I told you to stop doing. So uh, that finishes the first of those of those prophecies there. Um, if you want to kind of know what's going on for our next lesson, um, read Jeremiah 3 and 4. And that will kind of help you kind of start to get it.